All right, everybody, let's give Jesus some praise tonight in the house. Glory to God. Hey, uh, what a blessing it is to be here. I just want to give the Lord thanks for the uh, trip he gave me to Sweden and the Ukraine last week. I was uh, there, got to speak nine times. Come on now. And the greatest thing was to meet our 20 leaders from Russia. They came, one guy came from eight time zones all the way. He flew to Moscow and then to the Ukraine. One from Egypt came and they told about so many people being saved in Egypt. Literally, it's hundreds of thousands are being saved in Egypt. And just so much going on. And then Monday, I took five flights and flew home. One day, five flights. Some of you ain't been on five flights in your whole life. Five flights. I left Monday morning from the border of Russia, and I was in Baker Monday night. We live in a crazy world, don't we? So tonight, I'm really excited. I've been preparing, you know, this last part of chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. We have been making our way through. We finished chapter 5. This is the last uh, message on chapter 6. Then we do 7 for the last four months of the year. But this one is really amazing because we're going to be talking about worry. Look at your neighbor say, you looking kind of worried these days. <laughs> And I think I really, I really, I got to get started in this because so much depends upon the ability to rest and the ability to hang loose. Daddy's big phrase was hang loose, keep it simple and travel light. And I just been thinking about Psalm 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I don't know if you came tonight with stress, you know, worry is a huge issue uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf says that 75%, the American Medical Association said 75% of disease has stress at, at the core of it somewhere. So this is a, this is a, that's why I call it dis-ease. It's a lack of ease. It's a lack of wor- of, of, of the peace of God. So tonight's message, I think, really are some perspectives that are going to change you. And let's, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we thank you. Tonight, Lord, for Jesus, our great shepherd, who leads us by still waters and restores our soul. And we thank you tonight, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, there's a sense of rest, a sense of peace coming for anxiety, for worry, and for stress. And we just thank you for it tonight. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. You're our example. You walked in great peace and rest here on the earth. And we thank you that we walk in those footsteps in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen Amen and amen. Now, if you want to open your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus three times said, I say to you, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. And my, my message tonight is entitled, Seven Ways to Take Authority Over Anxiety. And right in this passage, it's only just about seven or eight verses, but boom, 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 boom. The Lord gives us these perspectives, and it's it's such wisdom. And and so that's that's what's important to me. And in the last chapter of this book, or the last few uh, lessons, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. And then he goes right into this issue of worry. I think really the whole God of mammon is behind the spirit of worry. It's behind it. And if you look at our nation right now, people are just, they're so worried about the future. They're worried about this asteroid coming in September. They're worried, and some of you ain't even heard about that, so you haven't worried about it yet. But they're just, people, they're, every day, the media, now with social media, FaceTime, all, I mean, we just, we're up to date on worry. And if you're not worried about something, it means you're not up to date with the world. And I'm, 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 I'm letting you know that these principles tonight are not, they're not normal things. But Jesus said, if you, you cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, if you serve mammon, then you're going to have to let mammon take care of you. And he's not going to do a very good job of that. But if you'll serve God, 
then God is going to take care of you. You know what? The example came to my mind was Moses Ewo over in Nigeria. When we were missionaries in 1976 there, Melanie and I, they had been in a war, the Biafran War, about 10 years earlier. And Moses Ewo, our main guy there, still is our main guy there. He said everything in the whole jungle had been killed. Every animal had been killed. There was nothing. They had stripped it because they had been surrounded and were starving. 10,000 people a day were starving to death in Biafra. And Moses, nobody had anything to eat. Now imagine what this was like. But Moses said he made a fishing pole and he went to the river. And he said every single day during that war, he caught enough fish for his entire family to eat. And other people were fishing, couldn't catch anything. But Moses said, I went through the whole war and I never lacked. Now you think of Israel in the wilderness, brothers and sisters. He, he, the Lord fed them with millions of tons of manna, millions of tons and an ocean full of water. You, you get three million people, five or six gallons a day. You're talking now in the millions and hundreds of millions of gallons of water that flowed from a rock for 40 years. So if God was able to do that, Jesus moves into this section of scripture about worry. And he says, now I'm, he says, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, he came from heaven, of course. He's the father's son. He said, I'm telling you. You have nothing to worry about. Now, our problem is we think we have so many basic needs. Basic, hello. I mean, if we don't have high-speed Internet, we just feel like we're, we're, we're just... You, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, our clothes, Jesus is going to talk about food and clothing. Clothes... We, we give away more clothes than we have. We don't even know what to do with all our clothes. Food. Jesus is talking about food. We got food network, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> we got shows all day, people eating food and trying this little delicacy and that little. And so we are, I'll tell you what, a lot of our worry comes from our spoilness. Can you agree with me right there? Many of the things that Americans are worried about have no relevance in any other country in the world. I was just in Sweden, and a man from Indonesia was giving the testimony of Christians that are dying there. Islamic people are killing Christians in Indonesia right now, cutting off limbs. And I saw pictures of, of amputees that were praising God. that they, they, gave, they gave their life, and here we are. We're concerned that it's got too much hot pepper on it or something. And let me, let me just, every worry in your life, back up and just start putting it through the filter of reality. Oh, my internet's not high, high speed enough. Dude, you didn't even have the internet till 15 years ago when Al Gore invented it. Isn't that right? <laughs> you didn't even have it. So back up a little bit. Quit, quit being so spoiled. And Jesus is only going to talk about food and clothing in these, in these nine verses. In other words, to him, everything else is not worth worrying about. What's your problem? Get over it. But food and clothing, Paul said in 1 Timothy 5, we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we cannot take anything out of the world. You're not leaving with anything. When you leave for heaven... Or if you don't know the Lord and you go to hell, believe me, you really got some worries then, dude. But if we have, say the next two things, food and clothing. food and clothing. That if we have food and clothing, this is Paul writing, 1 Timothy 6. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. In other words, let's not start talking about all of the other things, do I have an iPod, do I have a laptop, do I have a car, do I have tuition? Let, 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 all of those things are important, but you know what? Nobody died. If you don't have the rose-colored iPhone, nobody died, okay? <laughs> quit worrying and quit stressing quit about things that don't matter. All he said is if you have food, and clothing. And I can look at most of you and tell you have plenty of food. <laughs> so 
Here, you know, and I believe that the devil knows if you fret and worry, you're useless in the kingdom of God. You're in full retreat. So let's come into these seven principles. I, I don't have, I have about 30 more minutes, and I'm, I'm going to give them to you. Of course, they're all a sermon in themselves. But the first thing Jesus said is in verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So he's, he, he's going to talk about food and clothing. He said, by the way, the fact that you are alive is more important than food. Really. I mean, if you're breathing, you're here in church tonight. You're not in the hospital. Can I say, can you say amen to that? You're not in jail. You're, you're in church. You drove a car here, best I can tell. And so he said, life, life itself is more than food. And the body, the fact that you have your body and your ears and your eyes and all of the functions and systems of the body are working, your body is more important than your clothing. After all, clothes only came from sin. They only came from shame. Adam and Eve were naked until they sinned, and the only reason we have clothes is to cover our shame. So he said the body is more than food and, and, and more than clothing. So here's the first principle. God gave us life. Surely he can support it. Put that in the blanks. The human body, follow me on this first little, little point Jesus is making. The human body is proof that God will provide. I mean, why would God make us with a mouth, nose to smell food, mouth to taste food, and a stomach to digest food and a cellular structure to grow with food. Why would he, the complex system of, of, of ingestion and digestion, why would he do that and then not give you any food? Really? I mean, that would be like a half a creation. He doesn't stop halfway in his creation. He made us to eat, and he made us to need clothing. So that the first point to me is if God gave us life, and how many of you believe that God actually is the giver of life? You believe that? If he gave us life, why would he not give us the fuel we need to, to cause that life to happen? Okay, that's point number one. The Lord Jesus is teaching. Number two, I'm just going to touch on these. Birds live Day to day, and they do just fine. This is verse 26. He said, look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Now, by the way, before I keep going, somebody said, well, Cena, there it is right there. I don't even need to work. I had a guy say that. Because <laughs> the scripture says that birds... Don't sow or reap or gather into bars, yet your father feeds them. So he says, I don't need to work. All I need to do is have faith. But have you noticed how hard birds work? Have you noticed that? They work. They're out there scratching. They're pecking around. They're building their nests. They're carrying sticks. Birds work. So God, I, I have not noticed that God delivers food to birds. Come on, now say Amen. amen. God don't deliver food. In fact, you say, well, he delivered food to Israel in the wilderness. No, he did not. He dropped food. They had to get their hips out of bed and go get them some. <laughs> God is not going to give you food. He's going to give you the ability to generate food. It says he gives you the power to make wealth. Get your rear end out of bed and go get you a job. God has provided you a job. J-O-B. Come on. Tell your neighbor, J-O-B. Birds, birds work, man. Go, go, watch them. They peck it all over. <laughs> Look at them chickens out in the chicken. You think chickens are laid up in the hen house just? 
Yes, you're right. Put my scripture back up there. It says that the birds, they do not reap or sow. That's true, or gather into barns. But, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And feeds in the sense of he gives them the ability to go get it. Are you not of more value than they? Now, let me just point out, birds are unable to lay up food in the winter. They cannot store food. That's right. And the Father gives them food in the winter. See, he provides. Where do they get food in the winter? When it's 20 feet of snow somewhere, they still survive. How do they survive? God provides, even in winter seasons. God's going to provide. Jesus didn't have tax money one time. He said, that's all right. Go fishing. Pull up a fish and see what's in its mouth. God has ways and means. He's got sources that you don't know anything about. Even in a winter time of life, God is going to lay out your corn right in front of you. You're going to find it. That's right. Because he said your heavenly father knows that you need it. Now, birds only have a creator. They don't know God as their father. They know him as their creator. You know God one level higher than a bird. You know him as father. I am a child of God. He is my heavenly father. If he would provide for a bird, hello, why would he not provide for the beautiful people sitting in this room tonight, really? And all those birds out there, they just are working. God just lays it out there for them. So he said, are you not more valuable than they? Other parts of Scripture say that a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without the Father's personal omniscient understanding that that bird fell. He said, so therefore, you are of more value. I'm reading that in the Scripture. You are of more value. Value. Now, I was just in 30 miles from the Russian border Monday. And you know what? In a communist country, dude, they don't believe in God. They do not. And they, everything is just, uh, we're an animal. We're another animal. We have no soul. We have no eternity. We're just an animal. And they treat humans like that. They treat them like animals. That's why the, the 50 million were killed in Russia by Stalin. That's, that's why. Because they don't think about it. That's why Hitler, same thing, kills six million Jews. Don't think about it. Godless. But when you know God and you know that a human being is so valuable. Now, I think about my six children and my little daughter over in, in Africa. Of course, little Sharon, I consider her my daughter. When you think, think of our children, how valuable. This morning I had five little grandchildren at my house. That's why I had to leave and come to the church. No, not really. <laughs> no, five little grandchildren running everywhere. And you talk about sweet. I mean, little Destin was there. and Little Ansley was there. Beautiful, beautiful. And then Fiona showed up and Micah came running in and Lachlan is back on the floor. Well, that's just five of my 11. Come on now. But they're so valuable. There's not anything they could need that I would not be concerned about. Well, see, this is God. So we look at the birds. Number three, worry is useless to prolong your life. Just slip it in the blank there. Worry, it, it will not prolong your life one second beyond when the Lord knows your time is up. Now, I'm going to give you a sobering thought right now. God knows when your last day on earth is. He knows. He knew it before you were born. The Bible says it in his book, all your days are written before they were all even accomplished. He already knows. Now, you are not going to prolong beyond that moment. It's going to happen. It's already seen. He's foreknown that. It's, it's, it's coming. Why would you worry about when that day is? See, you cannot prolong. I think about Steve Jobs. He a, was a multi-billionaire, created the Apple Company. And he had a liver issue, waiting on a liver transplant, he died. Well, you know what? It didn't matter how much money you, he had. He could not prolong his life one day beyond that sickness. He could not do it. So Jesus said, now we're in verse 27. He said, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour. Now, the King James says a cubit, which is a span 
of, 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 of distance, but actually, it, I, I think in this translation, correctly says it's talking about a span of life. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? My daddy died at 97. Uh, my mother died seven years earlier than that. We, we don't know. Brother Clark died last year or two years ago. My daddy died last year. You, you don't know. You don't know the day. You don't know the hour. So why should we worry about that? Because God knows. God loves you. And the other thing is you cannot prolong your aging either. Now, I know there's all these techniques <laughs> to prop this up and to stretch this back. I understand that. But honey, let me tell you, it's coming for you. From the day you're born, you start to die. That, I mean, that's just the way it is. Gravity is going to work on you. Stuff is going to fall and stuff is going to hang, brother. So you, you can't prop everything up. And... Yeah, I see these people get these faces. They try to smile. Their mouth has a hernia. <laughs> Forget it. I, listen, Melanie and I have decided we are going to age and we're going to enjoy it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hey, my question, what's the alternative? <laughs> you say, I don't want to age. Okay, go ahead and die. Like the guy said, hey, I want to go to heaven. I said, you mean right now? <laughs> so you can't prolong your life, that crow's foot and all that stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Here's the fourth thing. Jesus taught us now. I'm in verse 28. See, he, he started out with your life. Your life is more important than clothes and food. Then he talked about the birds that the heavenly father feeds them. Then he talked about death. It's coming. You don't know when, but you can't stop it. God knows. He's in charge. He's, he's fine about it. He knows it's appointed unto man wants to die. He's okay about it. He's going to bring you to heaven. He's excited about it. He knows when you're coming. He's got your reservation made. So just, hey, let her rip, tater chip. I mean, that's the way it is. <laughs> okay, number four, verse 28, consider the lilies. This is another perspective. Consider the lilies of the field. Now, he's going to really zero in on clothing. For how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Now, remember he said the birds don't sow or reap or gather into barns. These neither toil nor spin. That means they don't sow clothing. They don't sow anything. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, I went to the crown jewels in the Tower of London. Melanie and I went through there. And I saw her coronation dress. It was made out of solid gold thread. I'm talking about gold thread. Ladies, that little thing you're wearing tonight, don't be too proud of it. It's... <laughs> and I saw the staff they put in her hand. It had a diamond the size, it looked to me like, of a tennis ball. Now, men, that diamond you gave your wife, <laughs> don't be too proud of that either. But he said, Solomon in all his glory could not compare to the beauty. We were in Singapore a couple of years ago. We went to this orchid museum thing. Not a museum, but a, like a greenhouse looking deal. And I'm telling you, hundreds of the most beautiful orchids my eyes have ever seen. In Vancouver, they have this place that is a, a like a massive gardens, bush, bush gardens or some type thing. You cannot believe. It looks like you, I turned a corner and I saw a field with a waterfall at the end and flowers growing all up around the waterfall. I'm talking about thousands of variety. I, I, I just, I couldn't believe. People have gone to heaven and had visions of heaven and then come back to this earth. They say the flowers there are the size of number three wash tubs up there. God is so amazing in his clothing and how he clothes the lilies of the field. And they ain't around, but just no longer than 30 days, 15 days. Some of them don't last 
one day. They don't last 24 hours. And the Lord says, and then afterward, they're gathered and they're thrown into the oven. And he says, for you are of such little faith. He called them, O you of little faith. You see that phrase right there? Jesus Christ is the only one who ever said that in the Greek language. And I can't pronounce it too well. Oligopistoi. Little faiths with an S on it. He said, you're just a bunch of little faiths. That's all you are. And what does that mean? Well, you have to have a little faith in order to be saved. They were saved. But they were not acting on all the promises of God. I know people who know Jesus, they're saved, but they have no faith in the rest of his promises. And so they live conquered lives. You can be saved and yet defeated. You react the same as unsaved people. You listen to so much media that you live an anxious and a fretful life. You're a little faith's. And then we lay awake for hours just going over and around in circles over the same miserable little details about some person or something. Just hours and hours and hours. You bought this, now you're worried about it. Somebody said people buy on the layaway plan and then they turn it into the lay awake plan. Because it's all going on and on in our mind. The disciples, he said, he said, y'all are worried about food all the time. Remember one time on the boat, they, they said, well, what are we going to eat? We, we forgot to bring any bread. And he said, why are y'all worried about bread? I multiplied five loaves and fed 5,000 people. Oh, ye of little faith. When a person is a worry person, I don't care if they're Christian. I don't care if they've been church 50 years. They're a person of little faith. Are you getting this right now? And so it's important that we, that we not be like Peter who had little faith or any of those others. That we say, Lord, if you can clothe the lilies of the field, I believe you will keep my human body warm and clothed with what I need to protect me from the elements. Now, when we get into whether it's rayon or polyester or silk, I don't, care. I don't think God really cares. Go get you whatever you want down at TJ Maxx. I don't think that matters to him. But can I tell you what matters? He does not want his child to be cold. Come on, say amen. amen. The fifth thing is this, verse 32. The Gentiles seek after all these things. Gentiles, that's heathen. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Now, you'll notice he uses the Gentiles as opposed to your heavenly father. Gentiles have no heavenly father. Put that in the blank. This is a perspective. If they're Gentiles and they don't know God, they don't know him as their father. Gentiles fret and worry about everything. Your heavenly father is those he's speaking to who are under the care and the protection and the blessing of the heavenly Father. Now, we're just going to sit here in this room just a minute, and we're going to meditate on the fact that we have a Father who made the universe. And He knows when you came in and you sat down, He knew the chair you sat down in. The Bible says He's counted the hairs of your head, even the ones that fell off years ago. He knows where they are. <laughs> we're talking about an infinite being, a great being that occupies His thoughts with you. David said, before I was formed in the womb, you knew me. He said, for multiplied thoughts that you think about me continually. You're on God's mind. You're on God's radar. You know, I've brought children to a playground and they're out playing and they're enjoying the swing and the slide and everything. But let me tell you something. Papa is sitting there on the bench and I am watching over my kids. And if I see one start to get a little hurt or they get the fall off of this, whatever, I get up and I make my way over there to them because that's my child. And if you get over close to them and I don't know who you are and you look like Chester the molester or something, <laughs> I'm coming near. That's mine. And I remember we lost Joel one time at the top of an escalator. Melanie will remember this. And we could not find. That little booger had gotten under some clothes in a clothes rack. 
And man, I mean, we went down that escalator and up again. We lost him again in Sears one time. And all it takes is just, you know what? So the Father, the Heavenly Father, when you, the Bible says there will never be anything in the depths of your heart that he does not know about. There's not one thing in the very bottom recesses of your heart that the Heavenly Father does not know everything about. I have watched God provide for me in my life things that I had never even expressed to Him. How many of you would raise your hand and say, God's been really good to you? I mean, Melanie and I look at each other sometime at the things He's given to us and provided for us, and we just say, how did God know? How did God know that we would just love this thing so much? It's because, and I'm going to tell you pastor, you men something. One time the Lord gave us something and he said, this is not for you. I'm giving this because of your wife. I'm giving this to her. He gave her a gift. Unbelievable. Well, see, you, you have to understand, this is the fifth thing. The heathen don't know God that way. Ask a Muslim. They only know a God of fear and anger and wrath. They have no idea. No, he's tender. He cares. He loves you and he'll, he'll meet any need that he feels is in the bottom of your heart. Number six. I'm just, I'm just giving these as quick as I can. Verse 33. Kingdom focus drives out worry. Put that on your notes. Kingdom focus. Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, I love that conjunction right there, because if you will just first seek the kingdom, get the whole thing about life as the kingdom of God, and that you're going to walk in holiness and purity and please God and all of that stuff, you say, well, that ain't going to get the bills paid. Well, that is not what this verse says. It says if you'll focus on expanding the kingdom of God, every morning you wake up and say, Lord, what can I do to move your kingdom forward today? That's what I pray every day. What can I do to move your kingdom forward today? It says, and all these things will be added. Added in the Greek is a word that means something that is added to you or thrown in for good measure. When you went to the market, you bought wheat and they put you a container of wheat on the balance and they fill the balance and it fill right up to the right measure and now it's perfect and that's what you get. But then he would take a handful of something, some wheat, and he would pack it on the top. So it was above the measure. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and for good measure, God's going to throw in all your other stuff and add it to you. Just for good measure. And can I tell you, when he adds, brother, he adds real good. And so that's an important thing. You, and, and you can't, don't tell people not to worry. Tell them to fall in love with the king. Just just fall in love with the king. Okay, now we come to the last one. And I think this is my favorite. And i kind of been moving toward this one as fast as I could. Because I believe this is the most important perspective. Yes, life is the most important. Then birds are very important. The death day is very important. Lilies are very important. The father is very important. The kingdom is very important. But now we come to the last thing that I want to bring out that Jesus told us about worry. And if you still got worries, this is one is going to cure you right here. Live life one day at a time. And the word I get from that is tomorrow. Verse 34. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Everybody say tomorrow. There's a song like it, tomorrow, never be tomorrow. For tomorrow, will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, I want to tell you a delivering mechanism from worry. Most of worry has to do with the future. If you think about it. It ain't even happened yet. And you're already worried about it. I heard about a husband who tried to tell his wife, stop worrying. He said, what has it accomplished you? She said, oh, it's accomplished a lot. She said, 90% of the things that I've worried about have never happened. (laughs) 
Hello? But it's not because she worried. It's because they weren't going to happen anyway. Most of the things that you're worried about right now will never, ever happen. And some people worry continually just about the future. You, you look at them and what, where they're living. They have everything they need. They have this. They have that. You can see it, but they can't see it. All they can talk about is, am I going to have enough tomorrow? What about next week? If you say, oh, it'll be there tomorrow. Well, what about next week? Well, then what about next year? And, and people stretch their worry out as far as they possibly can. Worry has a very active imagination. I've, I've, I've seen that. You can think yourself into a, an absolute frenzy over nothing. It's nothing. I, I remember the, uh, the Titanic was sinking. And about 30 women were in a lifeboat. And a man got in there, you know, dressed as a woman. And when they found out he was dressed as a woman, well, anyway, he was a deckhand. He dressed as a woman, jumped in the boat. Well, when they got him, he, he was steering them, you know, away from the boat. And all he was talking about was negative. We're going to die. Uh, he said, I've been in three shipwrecks. This one, we're so far out, we're going to die. And you've heard the unsinkable Molly Brown. That, that was about this. She was from Mississippi. And she looked at that man and she said, if you don't shut your mouth, we are all going to throw you in this frozen water right now. And he shut up. And they were rescued within an hour. He said, it's impossible. There's no way. In his mind, it was over. And I don't know what you're entertaining in your mind about disease, about a home. You're going to lose your home. You're going to lose your job. You're not going to pass your exam. You're not going to get married. You're not going to stay healthy. You're not going to succeed in business. The devil just loads your wagon and it's all about tomorrow. It's not about today. I'm not going to have food tomorrow. Yep, but do you have something to eat today? You won't know if you've got breakfast until the sun rises tomorrow morning. You don't know what God will do. You, you have no idea how he can provide. But if you're always worried about next year, now those of you that are nearing retirement age, you get all concerned about retirement. Lord, I don't know how we're going to make it. And I believe you should prepare. I really believe that's a part of wisdom and all of that. But you know what? The same God who's taking care of you right now. As I remember in the scripture, it says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Or his seed begging bread. Never. So you got to make up your mind that most worries never materialize. I heard that, that great statement. They said most people are crucified between, between two crosses, two thieves. One is regret from their past. And the other is worry from their future. And it destroys their life. Regret or worry, either one. Live for today. I need grace to face today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll be there to meet you tomorrow when the sun rises. So this is a critical, to me, this is great. I know I could worry tomorrow. I'll have a whole fresh pack of troubles and things. Jesus said sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. My daddy told me years ago, Larry, don't borrow trouble. I said, what do you mean, Papa? He said, don't look ahead at what might happen. Enjoy what is happening right now. Now, let me close with this illustration Charles Spurgeon gave. It's been a good, good night, hasn't it? I, I've enjoyed this. Let me close with this. Charles Spurgeon said, you've heard the story of Leonidas, you know, the 300, the movie King Leonidas, he held off the Persian troops of King Xerxes and they were, had them outnumbered like hundreds of thousands. Only 300 men held off all these hundreds of thousands. How did they do that? Well, if you hadn't seen the movie, they were on the plain and King Leonidas put his 300 men in a very narrow little passageway that all those soldiers had to pass through. Now, if he had taken his men and gone out in the plain and 300 against 100 million or however many, what it was, you know, thousands and thousands, they would have been slaughtered within minutes. But because they positioned themselves in that narrow passageway, every soldier 
of that big army had to pass through that little small wedge, that little small place. And they held them off for a long, long time because they took them one at a time. Now, let me just tell you, you are positioned right now tonight. You cannot go out and fight all life's battles at one time. You cannot do that. You are going to stand in that small gate and you're going to take those devils one at a time. And you know what that passageway is? That's every day. You're going to take on this one today, and I'm going to whip the devil today, and I'm going to whip the devil tomorrow. And in 2025, I'm going to be standing in that little place, and I'm going to be ready again. On sun sun up, when he comes through there, poof, I'm going to knock him out. That's life. Come on, say amen. Amen. Glory to God. Stand with me all all over the crowd. Thank God. What a blessing Jesus teaching us is such an amazing thing. Now I want you to close your eyes with me just in the last few seconds. And we're going to meet with our small group leaders right after this. We'll gather just for a a short time together. But I want you to go back across these seven points. And I'm going to select the one that is that third point. You cannot prolong the day of your death. Whether you worry about it or whether you got tons of money, you are never, ever going to prolong that moment. It's going to happen. It is appointed unto man. You have an appointment. You don't know about it. God knows about it. They didn't know about it the day the jet flew in the Twin Towers either. It's appointed. God doesn't do those things, but He knows when they're going to happen. If you're here tonight and you know I love you, but I can't love you as much as God loves you. He loved you enough to send His Son to the cross. He provided His Son. And by the way, His Son hung naked. He didn't even have clothing, and He had no food there on the cross. He was bankrupt for you and for me. And you're here tonight, and you say, you know what, Pastor? Worry is a huge issue for me. I worry about death. My uncle died with a heart attack. I worry about so much stuff. Well, you know, once you know Jesus... You will never feel a victim of worry again, ever. You're going to feel peace. My daddy's favorite verse, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. If you're here tonight and you would say, I really can see that I I don't know God. I don't know him the way I should. I I don't really know that I can lay on my pillow at night and not worry about dying even in the night if I were asleep. And you would like to settle that issue here tonight. Every, every head is bowed. And there's not one person looking. But the Lord is working. He's working in this room. And if you would say, include me in that prayer. Pastor, include me. I don't want to worry about that day when my time has come. I don't want to. I want peace. And I'm going to fight life one day at a time from that day forward. Now, if that's you and you'd like to be included, here's what I want you to do right now. Think about it. Quickly reverently just slip up your hand toward heaven and say God I want you in my life just do it that's right lift it up high all across the room there 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 back there 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 I know the devil's so mad to see your hand up there 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 see that's saying I am not going to run my life anymore the heathen don't know God but you're about to know him there I see so many of you with your hands raised okay here's what I want everybody to do put your hand over your heart Worry is a heart problem. It's a lack of trust. It's a little faith problem. And I want us to pray this out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you know me, everything about me. You know my sin. You know my failures. You know my mistakes. But I'm asking you tonight to have mercy on me, a sinner. Today I leave sin behind. I turn from darkness. And I turn to the light. I turn from worry. And I turn to a father. I receive you, Jesus. Come into my life. Give me peace. Peace like a river. Cover my life. I give you my life. I'll not be afraid. But I will seek first your kingdom, your righteousness, 
add all these things, everything I need. Forgive me for complaining, for whining about everything. And I thank you, Father, that you are my daddy. I love you, Father. Now lift up both hands and begin to worship him. Worship him. He's been so good to you. He's given you food and clothing. That's all that Paul said we need. But he's given you a car. He's given you a job. He's given you a home. He's given you a master bedroom. He's given you a couch. He's given you an HD TV. He's given you another car. He's given you a job. He's given you a business. Just start thanking him. Come on, just start thanking him. That worry is going to leave. Don't worry about tomorrow. Thank you for what you've got right now. Thank you for all things that he has provided for you right now. Glory to God. Come on, let's give the Lord a great shout of praise together.